Okay, so we just defined maxima, minima, boundedness, and suprema and infima. So now we can use those to phrase the um, completeness property of R, which this book calls the completeness axiom. So com the completeness axiom of R, as this book calls it, is simply the statement that, uh, so if S is a subset of R, sorry, uh, <clears throat> the bounded above, then sub S exists in R. So there's an element of R which serves as the supremum of S for any subset which is bounded above. Okay, that's completeness. Um, and it, like I was describing before, this is basically tantamount to saying that there are no gaps in R because like I said, any of the, any like missing number, any gap in the number line could be detected by finding a subset whose supremum would be right at that gap. And then, so, you know, if all the subsets have suprema, then there are no gaps. Uh, and like I was saying before, you know, you can imagine this process of building the real numbers by basically going through the rational numbers, even though this isn't possible because it would take an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of space and stuff like that. But if you could go through every subset of the rational numbers and just for each one, if it was missing a least upper bound, just like introduce a new number, then you'd get the real numbers that way. And it sort of makes sense uh, that the, there's only one possible number system that can result from that. So it turns out that the real numbers, and it's not too hard to prove, but the real numbers are the unique, um, the unique complete ordered field. The, all, if you combine all the axioms that we've talked about so far, there's only one number system that satisfies all of those, and that's the real numbers. Um, other, any other construction you could make would be like isomorphic, basically, if you know what that word means. But anyway, so, so that's how you get the real numbers. They, so the reason I put it, this in quotes is because we take this as an axiom because we're not going to be actually constructing the real numbers. We'll take for granted that there exists a structure that satisfies the ordered field axioms and the complete axiom, completeness axiom, and we call that R. But uh, actually, in reality, if you were going to do this properly, you would construct the real numbers, say using like Dedekind cuts or something. And then instead of an axiom, this would actually be a property. It would be a provable property of that construction. Uh, anyway, so let's, um, so there's a corollary here that I want to get into. And so this will be kind of a short little segment here. But um, so as a corollary of this, this is corollary 4.5, which is on page 23. Uh, any, subset bounded below has an infimum. Okay, so I want to go through this to illustrate a couple things. Sorry, this is bounded. A couple things. First of all, suprema and infima are like not actually different from each other, okay? If whatever you can say about suprema, you can make like a mirrored statement about infima and the proof will usually, if you prove something about Suprema, the proof for Infima will just be like a mirrored version, basically. And so you'll kind of see what I mean by that. But also, I want to show you something about the structure of proofs about Suprema and Infima. Okay, there's a sort of patterns. And this is going to be a recurring theme in this class is that when we introduce new definitions, and we prove stuff about them, a lot of the time, those proofs will start to, the, the, the format of those proofs will follow like certain patterns, right? So if we prove the limit of a sequence is some number, there's kind of a pattern to how you do that. If you prove um, that a, a, a function is continuous at a point, there's a pattern, right? Everything, there's all these patterns in analysis and you start to repeat the same thing over and over again. And so it pays, it pays to pay attention to uh, the patterns in how you prove things. So um, let's uh, prove this. So proof of corollary 
Uh, so let S be uh, bounded below. Define negative S to be the set of all the negatives of numbers in S. Okay, so the book has a really nice diagram here. I'll do my best to kind of like reproduce it. But basically, if you imagine here's zero, let's say there's some, you know, numbers that you include or whatever, right? And it's bounded below, um, then when you take negative s, you're literally just reflecting it across zero. And then, you know, we'd have these bits over here. And let's say this went on or something. Okay, so basically everything got reflected right across zero. So the reason we do this is because we want what we want to do ultimately in this proof is basically exhibit an infimum, right? Using the fact that we know we can always find a supremum of something, we want to actually find what the infimum of this is, right? So the best way to do this is to try to convert the problem into one of finding a supremum. And the way to do that is to just reflect this set because then the infimum actually becomes you know, a reflected version of the Suprema. That's basically the, the core idea here. So, um, so that's negative S. Um, now uh, set, let's see, S zero to be the negative Supremum of negative S, right? So we know that negative S is bounded above so I'm not going to write all of this stuff out, but you, you know, in the book, they state this explicitly that because S is bounded below, negative S is bounded above. Okay. Because any lower bound for S, uh, like this da dashed line here is like a lower bound. When you negate that lower bound, you get an upper bound for negative S, right? So um, negative S is bounded above, so it has a supremum. So this exists by completeness, right? Because negative S is bounded above, since S is bounded below. Uh, now we just have to show, now we want just want to show that S naught is the infimum of S. So how do we do this? Well, we have to show that S naught satisfies the defining properties. So what we have to do is first, um, say, let's see. Right, okay. Oh, I, I flipped the sign convention, sorry. They, they actually define S naught to be the supremum and then they show that negative S naught is the infimum. But I'm just gonna stick with this, so sorry. Um, so first we should show that S naught is a lower bound. So um, Uh, let T be an element of S. We just have to show that S naught is less than T. So then um, T, sorry, uh, so negative T is in negative S. So negative T is less than or equal to negative S naught, right? Since negative S naught is the supremum of negative S. So then directly that means that S naught is less than or equal to T, right? So, so that's the first part. That shows that S naught is a lower bound. But now we have to show that it's the greatest lower bound. So now we let, let's see what notation do they use? Um, Oh, actually, so then uh, they show that, or they, they leave uh, some of this as an exercise, which actually I think I put on the homework. So I'm gonna actually leave this, um, I'm gonna leave off here. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll leave this as a homework, so never mind. Anyway, uh, in the next video, I'll just cover a few stray 
bits about uh, the Archimedean property and denseness of Q, and that'll be it for this lecture. So thank you. <laughs>